You find yourself standing at the base of a nine-story tower. It's nighttime, but even still, you can see that the tower boasts impressive sculptures, carvings, and inscriptions on the exterior. You can't help but wonder how impressive the interior will be. You've been told by the locals that the most beautiful sights are only afforded to those who make it to the top. But when you ask for more details, you can't find anyone to tell you what sights to expect or what else you may see up there. You walk inside. You're greeted by a circular staircase that takes you all the way to the top. You take your first step and something feels off. It feels like something's watching you. A few more steps and now it feels like something is following you. You continue to move forward. Now you know something's following you. A blue light's been getting stronger from behind you. Was that a tentacle you just saw move out the corner of your eye? Keep walking. This is the story of the Abang Aku. Preface and Disclaimer. I typically have a rough structure for when I write these scripts. What is it? What's it do? What are the origins, famous or historical mentions of it, and references in pop culture? I won't deviate from that structure, but I'll give you a heads up since this is the first time I do something like this with one of the mythology episodes. I'm going to tell you the story, and then I'm going to give you my theory on it, since this is a creature that we've known about since at least the late 60s. Also, a reminder, I'm American, I'm going to absolutely butcher these Malay and Muir names, not on purpose, but out of ignorance of the language. So cut me some slack. What is it? The Abang Aku is a creature from Malaysian mythology and its name means elder brother. More on this later in my conspiracy section. This creature lives on the steps of the Tower of Victory in Chitorga, India, specifically Chitterfort, the capital of Muir. It lies dormant on the first step until the brave soul decides to climb the tower. In this dormant state, the creature is shapeless and translucent to the point of invisibility. As the person starts to climb, the creature wakes up from its hibernation and begins to closely follow the person. The higher up the person climbs, the Abang Aku's shape begins to stabilize, and it becomes more colorful. It gives off a blue light that gets stronger and brighter the higher it ascends. Once the climber reaches the middle of the tower, it's said that tentacles begin to grow, and touching it feels like touching the skin of a peach. It's also believed that the Abang Aku can see with its entire body. As it ascends the tower, its form gets closer and closer to perfection, but it can only ever reach the top if the climber it's following has reached Nirvana. An impossible task for most, so impossible in fact that it's believed to have only reached the top terrace once over the course of centuries. Once it's determined that the climber the Abang Aku is following hasn't reached Nirvana, the creature loses its brilliance. Its form begins to destabilize and it tumbles back down to the first step of the tower in a never-ending cycle of striving for perfection. It lets out a groan that sounds like the rustling of silk. Some versions of the story state that the Tower of Victory is a type of inner home gateway of the gods. The Abang Aku essentially became trapped in the tower after the fall of the gods, forever separating it from its true home on the divine plane. It's essentially stuck here with us humans until the next Buddha is born and makes their way up the steps. Tower of Victory The Tower of Victory's true name is the Vijaya Stamha and it's a victory monument located within Chitter Fort in Chittorgar, Rajasthan, India. The tower was constructed by the Hindu Rajput king Rana Kumbha of Muir in 1448 to commemorate his victory over the army of Malwa led by Mahmud Kilji in the Battle of Sarangpur. The tower is dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu. To commemorate this great victory, Ranakumpa built the Tower of Victory in the fortress of Chitter. 
However, before this tower can be completed, the Rana had to fight off some of the most powerful kingdoms in India at the time, the Gujarat and Malwa. These milestone events are inscribed on the historic tower. Sultan Mahmud Kilji remained a prisoner in Chitter for a period of six months, after which he was liberated with ransom by Rana Kumpa. The inscribed slabs in the uppermost story of the tower which contain a detailed genealogy of the rulers of Chitter and their deeds are ascribed to Ranakumha's court scholar, Atri, and his son, Mahesh. The names of the architect, Sutradar Jaita, and his three sons who assisted him, Napa, Puja, and Poma, are carved on the fifth floor of the tower. The topmost story also features an image of the Jain goddess, Padmavati. Conspiracy this was easily one of the more frustrating mythological creatures that I've had to track down information for, and I'll explain why. Everywhere I looked, listened, and read pretty much says a lot of the same things about this creature, and the focal point of all of it is a book from 1957 named The Book of Imaginary Beings, written by Jorge Luis Borges, or the original Spanish title Manual de Zoología Fantástica, or the 1967 expanded edition under a new name, El Libro de los Seres Imaginados. This is like the prime source that everyone cites when talking about the Abang Aku. And in this book, Borges claims to have found it either in an introduction to the Arabian Nights by Richard Francis Burton, or in the book on Malay witchcraft written in 1937 by C.C. Iturvuru. Well, I look through my copy of Arabian Nights and nothing. Turns out I have a different version of the book, so then I hunted down the version that was translated by Richard Francis Burton and nothing. In the original Spanish print of the book, he cites Burton, and in the English print, it's C.C. Iturvuru. What the heck is going on? Why is this so hard to hunt down? Well, the rabbit hole goes deeper. In the English print of the book, at the end of the entry for the Abang Aku, approximately page 15, depending on font size, Mr. Borges says, quote, This legend is recorded by C.C. C. Iturburu in an appendix to his now classic treatise on Malay witchcraft, 1937. End quote. A classic treatise, C.C. C. Iturburu, 1937. I have an author, an alleged classic piece of writing, and the date of publication. Iturvuru, as written in the book with a V as in Victor, is not the author's name. It's Iturburu with a B as in Bravo. I think this name change occurred to give some weight to the claim of the recording, and I literally think it's as shallow as the V spelling looking more Indian. I hunted down C.C. Iturburu, and he was a person that definitely existed. He was born February 16, 1899, passed away April 25, 1979, and has a daughter. C.C. Iturburu, whose full name is Cayetano Polinico Cordova Iturburu, and according to my research, he was a writer, poet, historian, and art critic. By all means, the man was a professional and scholar. I'm gonna give myself some wiggle room and say that I may be wrong. I doubt it, but I might be. I'm just gonna come out and say it. There is no treatise called On Malay Witchcraft written by C.C. Iturburu in 1937. I couldn't find that thing for the life of me. It's hard enough to track down anything on Mr. Iturburu then I thought I landed in a gold mine because I found an archive site that had everything on him, the poems he wrote, the art he critiqued, all of it. Sure, it's all in Spanish, but I don't have much of an issue reading Spanish. Still, no classic treatise on Malay witchcraft was anywhere in sight. I read through it, nothing. Then I control F'd and no keywords could bring up anything. Witchcraft, brujeria, Malay, 1937, dead ends for all of them. I don't think this piece of writing exists, and if it does, for some reason it's behind strict lock and key. 
So it isn't in Arabian Nights, and it isn't from this classic treatise on Malay witchcraft. Where the hell does this story come from? To be honest, I think it comes from the imagination of Jorge Luis Borges, the author of the Book of Imaginary Beings. I dug deeper, and even more things began to make less sense. The name of the creature, Abangaku, doesn't bring up anything, and then sources sort of explain this away by saying it's most likely a bastardization of the Orang Asli myth of the Abangaku. Well, I looked up the two words that make up the name, and sure enough, Abang is used as a way to refer to any older man, and is practically universal in its use across all the languages and dialects in the Malay region. Aku is kind of a crude or impolite way to say I or me by the Malay people. So slap those two words together and you have a crude way of saying older man I or me older man or something along those lines. If you wanted to just say older brother, you would just say abang and leave it at that. Then I tried to look for the words and their meaning in Aslian, the language of the Orang Asli people of Malaysia, and surprise, I found nothing. So naturally, I come to the conclusion that I believe there is just a crude understanding of the Malay language at play. I couldn't find this creature in any Malay mythology or folklore, and when it does pop up, it references Jorge Luis Borges. It feels like a chicken or the egg scenario. So did the Abangaku exist before Mr. Borges talked about it in his book, or did he speak it into existence and everyone just rolled with it for the last six decades? Personally, I think it's the latter because everything about this creature and this book is self-referential. In coding, this would be the equivalent of spaghetti code and would toss back an error the second you tried to compile. Another red flag that popped up in my mind is that this is supposed to be a mythological creature from Malaysian mythology. It has this whole story tied to it about the tower, the gods, why it's stuck there. Why is a Malaysian myth set squarely in an Indian capital? We're talking about a 1700 plus mile difference in location, depending on which start and end points you use, and if you have an airplane. Malaysia wasn't part of India as a country, but it was part of a cultural region known as Greater India. Ancient India influenced Southeast Asia through trade, religious missions, and other forms of contact, and pre-colonial Malaysia was part of these Indianized kingdoms. So the possibility is there that they'd have a story or two set in India, it's just odd because all of their other creatures are regional. Conclusion I believe the story of the Abang Aku is a creation directly from the imagination of Jorge Luis Borges. I think he came up with this creature and then used obscure citations in order to justify its existence in the book. I read it here in one edition and actually I read it here, surprise, my friend who probably won't rat me out is the one who wrote about it in another edition. I believe the Abangaku is what you get when you have a rough understanding of a region and its culture. If you can find me a source from Malay mythology that contains the Abangaku and it predates Borges' book, or better yet, find me the treatise written by Itor Buru, I'll recant this section of the episode and probably just record an entirely new episode with the updated information. People believe that this is a story about struggling to reach Nirvana, but as I read it, and since my charitability has sort of dropped, honestly I was reminded of the struggle of Sisyphus, the man who was punished for all eternity, told to push a stone to the top of a hill only for it to fall back down to the bottom, right before it reaches the hill's peak. The parallels between climbing something only to fall all the way back down to the start is just too strong in my opinion. Sure, you can see it as something trying to break the karmic cycle if you squint hard enough, but I think it just fits a bit better somewhere else. I believe Borges used this story as the foundation, then slapped what the West would consider Indian terms wherever they were needed in order to hide the origins of his inspiration for this creature. The Tower of Victory is also a relatively new building in the grand timeline of human history. I've seen others liken it to the story of the Tower of Babel, but the elephant in the room is that we know when the tower was built, why it was built, who commissioned it, and the name of the builder. 
it's a bit hard to sell the idea of this building being a home for the gods or the Tower of Babel in any kind of way when we have all the information surrounding its construction in great detail. According to TripAdvisor, people have reached the top of the tower, Nirvana or not, and they say that the views of the interior as well as the views of the surrounding landscape are indeed beautiful and recommend it 5 out of 5 stars. One interesting detail I found from TripAdvisor of all places is that access to the top of the tower has been rescinded. So, maybe the Abang Aku has been spoken into existence by the public's belief in it, and you need to reach Nirvana before gaining access. Who knows? This episode was a trip to research, and honestly pretty fun to write. I'd been planning saving my transcripts and making them Patreon exclusives at some point, but for this one, I want my sources to be checked. Maybe you can find the information that I couldn't. That concludes this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you enjoyed it, then like, subscribe, and share the podcast with your friends. This is Myths, History, and D&D, and I hope you tune in next time.